80% of this generation are underdeveloped jaws. A lot of the 35 year old women turn up with neck ache, back ache, anxiety, headaches, feeling crappy in the morning. If you go backwards, my generation is 30%. How come we've gone from 30 to 50 to 80% jaw underdevelopment? If your breathing's not 10 out of 10, the brain turns on the sympathetic nervous system at three o'clock in the morning and goes, mayday, 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 mayday. You're talking about those kids that are itchy and won't sit still. That's their sympathetic nervous system everything's affecting everything there and if the sleep's not right and the brain's not right you're not going to get a thriving human being on today's episode of nurturing healthy faces i have the pleasure of being joined by one of australia's leading functional orthodontists dr levi based out of sydney dr levi thank you so much for doing a, a video call with me today uh why hey, do you Katrina hi hi okay. hi hi pleasure pleasure to hang out with you thank you um just to get started why don't you share with us a little bit of your bio so listeners understand what your specialty is in terms of orthodontics okay so bio Dr Mark Levi well um okay we'll do a bio we'll do um you know naught I was I wet the bed till I was fourteen, uh, and had um, at eighteen I had lots of headaches and neck ache and jaw problems, and at I don't know twenty three I got a dentist degree at Sydney University. So my mum and dad were very proud of me. And then at forty, um, now what did I weigh at forty? I weighed seventy kilos, ran ten k's on the soft sand at the beach. At 40, they said I had the worst sleep apnea, I don't know, in Australia. And they said I wasn't breathing at all and I'd probably go and die eventually. And they gave me a CPAP machine at 40. So um, that was a bit of a, I remember crying, walk, driving back to work. I remember I remember that day very clearly. I remember crying all the way back to work thinking, what have I got? Because I didn't really understand what I had. It was a long time ago because I'm old. And so um, that was about 20 years ago. And so... Um, well, I jumped on a plane and went to the US. So I haven't lived there, thank heavens. But um, I've got 20 years plus of training in in the US. And so uh, that's a cool thing to talk about because I'm actually not an orthodontist. Um, I'm just a dumb, regular garden, garden variety dentist. That's all I really am. Um, although... Uh, after spending 20 plus years doing breathing and airway and sleep, I'm probably not so garden variety at all. And uh, got published in Europe about 10 years ago in the sleep journals. Um, I worked for a while with a, a lung specialist in my office. Um, so I've, I've, I've really spent a lot of time, 20 odd years, I suppose, or 15, 10 years, 15 years doing adults sleep, breathing, sleep apnea, that sort of stuff, and then fell into kids about eight years ago with a lot of my American buddies. Mm -hmm. And so all the guys and girls I talk to every day, I talk to America every day, I, I think, um, we all got into kids about naught to ten years ago. So I'll tell you one more piece of the puzzle and then I'll, I don't know, I'll leave and be quiet, Katrina. Did you know that sleep is about, I don't know, 40 years old? Did you know that they that adult breathing and sleep in uh, in dentistry especially is only uh, I think it's thirty years old, and that the kids stuff we do is probably around about the fifteen years old stuff. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that's new, and and I mean they only invented they only found out the brain which is busy er at night. 10 times busier at night, they only found out it's got its own irrigation system called glyphatics about, I think it was nine years ago. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this breathing, airway, sleep, brain stuff is new-ish. And so I ain't no Santa Claus. I've just been lately doing too many kids and hanging out too long in America and passionate about well, originally fixing me, and then it was about fixing everybody else. So, so I don't know if that's a bio, but that's a that's a it's a I've got that's a that's that's where I come from. Uh, I've come from being a patient. 
you've mentioned so many fascinating things here and it's almost like it was meant to be that many people who end up heavily engrossed in a very fresh area of medicine, like sleep medicine, as you say, it's only four decades old. You discovered it a few decades ago through lived experience. And I suppose you've been trialing on yourself and now with your patients and it's typically yep. the way it goes is you have to also live through this stuff to know how to dive into the rabbit hole and discover all of the evolving science in this sphere. You also mentioned that you've now gotten into children, which I'm guessing is fairly fresh information as well, because we tend to think that sleep apnea and sleep disturbance is this middle-aged or older man's issue. And now we're starting to realize it's prevalent amongst all age groups and surprisingly so even amongst kids. So can you tell us what you typically see day to day coming into your office? Because you're seeing children and adults. Do they present differently in terms of symptoms? I like, I think, I think I'm a, I like to say, I think I'm a smarty pants today because I did the adults for 15 years. Mm-hmm. or 10 years or 15 years and and so now I see the kids and I I must have been really dumb 10 years ago I don't know but but now that I'm seeing the kids and I've probably done about I don't know 2,000 kids mind you my 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 buddies in America have probably done 200,000 kids and so this isn't like we've done one or two this is like all day long every day mm-hmm. and so the kids stuff we now look at the kids and the learning curve is oh, I know what you're going to look like when you're 35 years old and I know what you're going to look like when you're 18 years old and and we can almost extrapolate. And now I look back at all the adult patients I saw and I go, oh, and now I can link it back directly to children. And so what does that mean? It means that go back to core problem. There we How about we go back to core problem, Katrina? How about we go back to core problem? Let me give you a revelation and then I'll be quiet for five seconds. It'll knock yourself off. Did you know, Katrina, that 80% of children in America and Australia, 80% of children, and England too, and any any first world country, 80% of the kids, and this is Professor Robert Corincini, who's looked at skulls, skulls, anthropology, his whole life, his whole life with his buddies. Um, imagine looking at skulls your whole career. And so, and he's old like me. And so imagine looking at skulls all your life. 80% of kids have underdeveloped top jaw and bottom jaw. Now we call them jaws, but in my world, we call them maxilla and mandible. But 80% of kids are underdeveloped. And that's the work of Professor Robert Corincini. And then there's a, there's, there's a, if you go backwards, if you go backwards, oh, I keep on bouncing the, t- the computer. If you go backwards, Katrina, mm. 50% of your generation are underdeveloped yours, mm. which is why so many people are having teeth straightened again. And well, a lot of the 35 year old women turn up with neck ache, backache, anxiety, uh, libido problems, grinding teeth, their headaches, feeling crappy in the morning. Um, but, so 50% of your generation, 80% of this generation, my generation, because I'm a patient, is 30%. Mm. So what you want to say to me is, Mark, oh, my God, Dr. Mark, how come we've gone from 30 to 50 to 80% jaw underdevelopment? Who the heck cares? Why do we care? Why do we care that this jaw and this jaw are smaller? Who cares? And so that, that's 10 questions for you, Katrina. We should hand out, like, multiple choice questions. Oh, my gosh. I didn't want to butt in at all because you were just divulging so much interesting, fascinating statistics and uh, knowledge there. It makes sense. We tend to see this, that kids, each generation is getting worse. And kids may not necessarily even look like their parents as much because their face, the mandible and maxilla, are two-thirds of their face. And if that's shrunken, that's going to change the visual expression of how their features look, the face is narrower, and so they don't have the jaws the size of their parents or grandparents, and we see that. But I had no idea. We're now up to 80% of the population of our young kids having a deficiency of the face, and why should we care? You're right. Well, now we're seeing that we've got all these airway problems, which is, like, so fundamental to how we can exist in the world and how our brain functions and how our organs are functioning whether we've got the anxiety, like you said, 
It was also interesting. You even brought up libido issues with women and men, like erectile dysfunction. These are circulatory problems that come down to low nitric oxide and low blood oxygen. So if you can't carry oxygen, how do you expect to get blood flow to the areas you want when it's time to get romantic? And so there's so many little things people deal with and have no idea it comes back to facial structure and ability to breathe properly. Do you drive a car? Do you drive you do do you drive a car, Katrina? I drive a van. Okay. Does it have like four wheels or something or eight wheels or what, what, yeah, what how many wheels? Four. Four. Okay. Do you put petrol in it or unleaded or gas or electricity? Diesel. What are you shoving it? Yeah, diesel. Okay, diesel. So what would happen if you put petrol in it? Yeah, it would it would suffer. It wouldn't drive very well. Okay. Well, what happens if kids don't breathe properly or what if adults don't breathe properly or what if you hold your breath for four minutes? What happens if you hold your head? I think it's, I think it's um, well, I don't know the answer, but imagine holding your breath for 10 minutes and seeing how you'd feel or whether you'd be around still. 10 minutes holding your breath, no oxygen, fuel, yeah. fuel, fuel, fuel. And so the most important commodity we've got we can live without water and food for a while and uh but imagine not having oxygen mm -hmm. and and be, and because it's invisible no one you know no one really notices that and that's really what we're talking about today we're talking about oxygen yeah. and so i'll tell you i'll tell you why we're smaller mm. Although I think, you know, you're you're a smarty girl. I mean, oh, my God, I read your bio, Katrina. You've done anthropology, sociology, the study of mankind, the study of people. You look, you understand skulls. How how did you get in? I mean, you, you know more than most of the medical, dental, allied health world know about structure and bones. How did you end up there? You're a smart girl. Wow, Dr. Levi, that's a massive compliment coming from you. And it's great to vibe with someone because we are coming to the same scientific conclusions through different avenues. Like you said, I did anthropology, sociology, and evolutionary psychology as my undergrad. And then through personal lived experience, similar to you, I had to delve into orthotropics because my face was really damaged by the mishandling of care of just traditional dentistry, which threw off my bite. So my jaws weren't lining up properly. And over time, it took 12 months to me to see the full effect of the damage. But if you're only chewing on one side of the jaw, the asymmetry from building up muscle and bone just on one side, while the other side's going through osteoporosis by not getting contact. And uh, I was going to surgeons and orthodontists and they're saying, oh, you'll need to have surgery or maybe we'll fill you up with silicon and we'll shave down the bigger side. And I'm thinking... If I do this, I've got no hope of ever truly realigning my face and returning to homeostasis because I've got silicon, et cetera, in my face. So I knew if this was gradually downward, downward slide damage, I could probably slowly turn it around. And that's why I looked into the scientific articles on how do facial mechanics work? Um, can faces be remodeled? I'd seen in America they were doing palate expansion with adults, and it was quite rare in Australia back in 2016 and 2017. Still rare today. It's still rare today. They say it's impossible. I can't stand people telling me, oh, you'll only tip the teeth, you'll only tip the teeth. How many times I've heard this, but I'd seen the studies, and the studies were old. We were doing twin studies, not we. Have, they you, seen were... Mark, have you seen Mark Levi's palate? <laughs> No, you haven't shown me. Mark <laughs> Levi's got a palate that's uh, that's that's grown substantially. So when yeah. they say it's impossible, I normally just there's a great friend of mine in uh, Malaysia who's uh, an ear nose and, ear nose and throat specialist in mm -hmm. Malaysia. He stopped yelling at everybody in the hallway because um, he just figures, well, no one's listening to me. I'm I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to read the new research and and see what's happening the in what's happening today and I'm going to. Um, have an open mind to what I learned 30 years ago and what I'm learning today. Mm. And so there's, there's it's like the work of Professor Karen Bonnock, B-O-N-U-C-K, out of the US. God, everybody I know is out of the US. And so she will tell us that 50% of kids in America diagnosed with ADHD 
mm. and give it Ritalin and speed and ecstasy. 50% of kids in the US do not have ADHD. They are misdiagnosed and they have a breathing problem. Mm. And so my comment, I was going to get excited, but I thought I'd be quiet. My comment is, gee whiz, I wonder how many mums and dads that have been had kids diagnosed with ADHD, I wonder how many of them have had a 22, 23, 24 screening, breathing, sleeping questions asked. And so we put together a screening two-minute questionnaire about six months ago because we hand out to, uh, well, anybody that will take it really. And so if you're going to diagnose a child with ADHD, I've got a problem with that. But I've got a problem that you need, it would be prudent with all the research out there, prudent mm -hmm. to ask about 22 sleep, well, low-hanging fruit screening questions about, about breathing and sleep. And what we're really talking about today is bone, breathing, mm -hmm. sleep, brain, symptoms. And I'll do that again because I think it's important. We're talking about top jaw bone, bottom jaw bone, air going in, down a pipe. I love my plumbers. Down a pipe, which should be a big, fat, huge pipe, not a little, tiny, little pipe. Air goes in, down this pipe, and that affects your sleep. And if you're a kid, that affects your growth hormone and lots of other things. Mm. And that affects your brain, which is busier at night. And if you're unlucky, you'll have lots of symptoms. If you're lucky, you'll have no symptoms. The symptoms and anatomy don't always weigh up. You might have lots of symptoms, you might have no symptoms. You might have good anatomy, you might have bad anatomy. Anatomy is bone, yeah. bone and structure. And we all need a six-bedroom mansion mm. with swimming pool, tennis court, triple garage to breathe through. We all need a big six-bedroom mansion to breathe through. And if your little Johnny is breathing through a one-bedroom studio apartment in the middle of Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, then that little Johnny's not getting enough breathing, oxygen, airway working. If he hasn't enough real estate, yeah. if he hasn't enough oral real estate to breathe properly, we have a problem, mayday, mayday, and that will affect your sleep and your brain and then maybe you'll get symptoms. And so if people are confused what we do, we look at bone, top jaw, bottom jaw bone, and we look to see whether it's optimal to breathe till you're 99 years old. Mm. And the only, it would be prudent again, if this is not the right size, we're talking about, I like to talk about kids because they're easy to talk about, because kids have till they're about 12, 13, 14, maybe 18 to help this bone be the right size to be airway breathing friendly. Mm. And if you miss that window, um, it, ain't, it ain't crash hot good. It's not all that great. And that's where I am. That's where I was. I missed that window because um, I'm old and uh, and I just figure that, there are mums that fly in from Melbourne to see us and there are mums and dads that come in from Brisbane and Darwin and Adelaide and I'm not Santa Claus. We've just been we've just done too many kids and make too much noise um, and they just see us because they're frustrated or because they've something resonated. Up, up. But at the end of the day, you've got a window with these kids to make them grow mm. bone and grow the six-bedroom house to breathe through. And my favourite patients, Katrina, my favourite patients are tradies because they just understand 4B2, 3B5. They understand make the house bigger to breathe. And they just go, well, if you haven't got a big enough pipe for the, for a, a a car or a tractor or mm. a, who do I see, a, a, a you know, these mechanical sort of tradie, you know, engineers, they go, well, that makes sense. You need you need a big enough pipe to get yeah. the air down there. Yes. And so it, it is absolutely uh that's what we're talking about we're talking about bone and we're talking about and you need to tell everybody why we're getting smaller katrina because you know why we're getting smaller 
Yes. We, why why is this problem getting worse, Katrina? You tell them why it's getting worse and why they should be worried about their kids. Yes. Well, it's not just one factor. We have a myriad of factors contributing to this problem. So whether you weren't breastfed, some children are like, yes, I breastfed my two first children for over a year, but I didn't realize I had tongue ties back then. And so they still had deficiencies of the jaws. And I thought, oh, I'm breastfeeding. I'm doing the right thing. It wasn't enough. I used to give them the pouchy foods, thinking, oh, this is convenient, no mess, vegetables on the go. Um, but, again, that can teach them the wrong musculature use where they're doing a reverse swallow or they're tongue thrusting. And so the tongue's not doing the proper swallow and pumping upwards. Uh, I used to give my kids green smoothies every day, being like, this is great. You know, they don't eat vegetables, but I'll give them a smoothie. Well, I'm not giving them the opportunity for long, hard chewing. And so you start to realize not enough chewing, not swallowing properly because we've got the pouchy foods or the sippy cup that encourages the tongue to come forward to stop the flow of water rather than pumping up. We, if we give them a pacifier, my first two didn't like pacifiers because they were breastfed. My third born, she went to hospital for uh, RSV and it, she was there for a week. I dried up, started bottle feeding. She actually has developed the best because she didn't have the tongue tie. I got onto that when she was newborn. But she's been using a pacifier and I'm thinking, what am I doing? I'm teaching her tongue to sit below something every, every night and during nap times and she looks for them during the day. She loves sucking them. And I think this isn't natural. I'm just going to disrupt her oral habit. And then, you know, I've talked about the consistency of the food we eat. We have a refrigerator which was popular when it first came in because you could store and preserve a meal for the family for the next day without changing the consistency. I'll just have leftovers, you know. I'll have a flavour infusion of something really exotic I've made for my guests and my family. Well, trying to be too fancy with your food often softens the consistency of it. And then these days we reheat meals in the microwave and it turns to slosh. So when are we actually doing the hard chewing? We eat sandwich meats, these deli meats that you do a few light chews and you swallow it. It's like no mechanical. What are, you, what are, you, what are, you, what are your thoughts on the 400 years of um, not chewing and the 200 years of electricity and the 100 years of factories? What's your view on all that and the epigenetic and the epigenetic ramifications of that? I think when you have a multitude of factors at play, it can really interfere with your growth. But some people, you look at them today and they look fantastic and they go, I had a fridge my whole childhood. I I wasn't eating um, dehydrated meat and yet they've grown pretty well. So no one of these things is a be all and end all, but when there's a combination and then for whatever reason, kids start mouth breathing because it's now common to live in populated areas with busy daycare centres where the kids get an onslaught of runny noses, viruses, uh, they've got their allergies. So they're stuffy here for weeks sometimes and they start to mouth breathe. Well, the nose may eventually clear up, but they've formed the poor habit of mouth breathing, which I've explained before to whoever's listening. Once they do that, that tongue drops from the top jaw to mouth breathe and let the air go over the tongue. Well, that robs the top jaw of that crucial muscular support that's going to push those bones up and out and broad and keep the upper airway healthy. So we've been looking at our kids with crooked teeth and mouth breathing, thinking, oh, maybe this is just who they are. Maybe, I don't know, something's going to ride genetically because we're told it's genetics. It's not just genetics. Our whole it's body. A, it's, a big, it's, a big, it's a big picture. My guys, some of my favourite heroes in the US sprout that if we saw every single four-year-old in the USA mm. and we got every single four-year-old's maxilla, and mandible to grow more, mm. we'd get rid of, um, this is my, some of my, my heroes in America, they sprout that they wonder how many, would we ever get rid of, would we get rid of ADHD, would we stop taking tonsils and adenoids out, would we stop pulling teeth out, would we stop having braces put on, would we stop having CPAP machines age 40? Would we, um, you know, how many, how many medical, would we, you know, how many medical ADHD, tonsils, uh, cognitive stuff, how many things could we improve 
if every four-year-old was looked at at four or at three, I've got to fix my granddaughter at three and a half. We're about to, I'm, I'm about to start my granddaughter at three and a half. How do you, how many kids, if we grow all these kids and get them growing mm. and growing with an airway-centric focus, so it's mm. airway-friendly, mm. not teeth-friendly but airway-friendly, how many of these kids would thrive and then I've, I've got a, there's a, one of my favourite guys in New York cracks the joke that says, if we got these, if we saw the four-year-olds and we got them right and their breathing was better, their sleeping was better and their brain was better, how many would not need private school and how many would not need $40,000 a year of private schooling because their brain is going to work so much better than every other kid in the class? And yeah. so that's. That's that's com that's that's conversation over a glass of wine type type banter. That's not that's not medical research. Mm. And and the yeah. other point I'd make is the other point I'd make, Katrina, is that I don't know if mums and dads know this, but if you let's talk about the four year old, if that's okay. If you make the four year olds top and bottom jaw grow, do you know, Katrina, do you know that that makes the nose grow, the sinuses grow, mm. tongue space grow? T space grow mm. and the work of um, Linda Oystrom out of Sweden about in 2018 will tell us that it will increase the real estate in front of the tonsils and adenoids by a substantial amount. And when that, that research came out, my guys in America went and re-measured re all their old cases and got all excited. So just think about it. We're talking about the mouth and that's affecting the nose, the sinus, the tongue, the teeth, the tonsil and adenoid space, mm. the airway volume. I mean, oh, my God, it's affecting everything above the shoulders, which is why they call it, in the when I hang out with my guys, they call that the craniofacial respiratory complex. Mm. So it's a big, everything affects everything. And, you know, how many mums know that the nose and the top of the mouth, the palate, are half a millimetre away? Mm. The, the palate is the floor of the nose. Mm -hmm. And so when, when mums turn up with, you know, 100 million different symptoms mm -hmm. and they go, what, it's all related, and, and we, we join dots, you know, so they understand. And I, I think it's important people understand that, that everything's affecting everything there. Yes. And and if the sleep's not right and the brain's not right and, the, and their oxygen's not right, you're not going to get a thriving human being, a thriving child. Mm, they're surviving. There's kids just surviving the day of school. And, you know, ADHD diagnosis through the roof. We're not giving them breathing and sleep studies. And children present differently to adults, don't they? When an adult is tired, we slow down, we look fatigued. A child, they're on this sympathetic overdrive of cortisol and adrenaline, so they're jittery. They cannot focus. They cannot sit still. They've got these little fidgety toys now everywhere. They've got to fidget because they're jittery. Their nerves are on overdrive. And I hate to think that because people don't understand this is all physiologically linked, the face, the brain, the body, and it's lifestyle getting in the way. How many children think, oh, I'm the naughty kid because I can't sit still in class. I'm disruptive. I can't manage my emotions. I, um, I'm irritable. And then, oh, I'm not the sporty kid because once you become a mouth breather, their tongue's low. They've got to change their posture. They're breathing through. And every, then they've got this S spine. The knees go in. They're pigeon toed. The whole spine's out of alignment. So they're not coordinated. Uh, they don't think they're smart. They think they're the naughty child. They internally. Oh, Katrina, we're going to get you speaking at the medical conferences overseas. God, we're going to get you talking to the doctors and the specialists. Well, I mean, this is how people will live the trajectory of the rest of their life, thinking there's something inherently faulty with them, not realizing our orthodontics, traditional, conventional dentistry that's just looking at teeth and not the palate and breathing, we could have fixed this when they were three or four. But instead. Well, when I went to dental school, they didn't, they didn't tell us what a tongue did. And they they told us what a tooth did, and uh, uh, I think I think there's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of kids struggling, um, 
and they will. They'll do okay. They'll 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 compensate. But uh, uh, if, if we need to go, we're well, not. We need to. It would be prudent to go back to square one and go. Is there an issue we can solve that will make my child thrive? Uh, that that will make them thrive a long, long time. And getting breathing right is number one and paramount. Yeah. Uh, and the research at the moment is about so, so, so deep of yeah. all the uh, 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 of of all this information. It's out there, and the mums find it, and so so it's out there. And you want uh, you, you don't want a child. So I did adults for too long. I don't want any children to be adult patients. I mean, you just don't want an adult patient in the office. Why would you want that? You don't want an adult patient in the office. Um, and so, uh, I'll and the mums and dads are reading, are reading. You know, we've got a whole library on our website of uh, great books, and uh, and these mums are finding these books and reading these books, and they're going, "Oh my God, this all makes sense." And so, and it's quoting, it's quoting medical re- re- literature. And so it's not crazy stuff. You know what I like to say, Katrina? Here's my favourite. My favourite is, there's a couple of, two favourites. One of my two favourites this afternoon, here's number one. Yeah. Number one is, have you got one of those phones, those Dick Tracy phones you talk to? Have you got an electric <laughs> car outside? No. You, you got a, you've obviously got a mobile phone. Yeah. Well, they didn't exist. They didn't exist 5, 10, 15 years ago. And so we're we're seeing a change in that. We're seeing change. We're seeing change in how we deal with airway and breathing. Mm. And my my other comment is that we don't mind making kids cute. Mm. We don't mind making anybody cute, Mm. but we'd like them cute and breathing. Yes. And so we put airway focused in front of everything we do because Mm. we think that airway and breathing should be at, at the very, very front of everything and yeah. so we don't mind making kids with teeth cute yeah. but we want them breathing as, as well it's it's been around this information's been around about breathing and sleep but it doesn't seem to be a sexy topic for people because it's this silent thing you take for granted and you're not really paying attention to how you sleep anyway you think oh i get seven or eight hours that's good enough not realizing if you're a snorer or you're waking frequently or waking up tired there could be a big problem there and many people are interested in make me beautiful. How do I express my full potential? They'll ask you about how to improve their face. But when you start talking health benefits, it's not as appealing to people because they can't really appreciate how much this does affect potential. You know, the old, in, the old, in the old days, I read a book years ago when I started in sleep by um, Alana. I've gone blank, but she's like a New York Times, Wall Street important person. And so she was living on three, four hours sleep, being a corporate executive. And uh, the name eludes me. She's someone important. And and uh, she 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 hit the wall and realized. I don't know who told her, but she then she started sleeping twelve hours a night, eleven hours a night, and re uh, re re you know turned made herself into a new person. So then she started writing magazines and book articles and tried a book. And so the two guys really, I think, that have changed the world with sleep and breathing mm. was why we sleep. Why we sleep by Matthew Walker was the first, mm. and that was a New York Times bestseller. I've heard him lecture in the US. He's a great guy. And the and the next guy that came along about eight years later was um, Nesbitt, James Nesbitt, who's a great speaker, and he he wrote the book uh, Breathe. And yeah. so you know that was a that that was a great. Um, a book for the general public to appreciate, not not pediatrically specific, just mm. general mums and anybody to go. This is what sleep's about. This is what breathing's about. And they they spoke to the audience, and both of them were New York Times bestsellers, and both of them were in every airport around the world because they were just being sold off. They were just selling, and yeah. so those two books really changed sleep and put sleep on the map. And I mean. I did a TV gig. Um, I had to research. It was, it was. I've done a bit of TV. There's a joke here that says the number of elite athletes, elite athletes that have a sleep coach, 
is, oh, my God, mate, Federer sleeps, I think Federer sleeps about 14 hours a day or something. Oh. Uh, there was a story I heard in America when I was at a lecture. They rang up, what was it, a Super Bowl. Super Bowl was on. They were going to win. They wanted to win. They they rang up. I've forgotten who, the guy's name, Michael, what's the name? Anyway, he told he told the coach to tell the team to have a, a, sl- a, a, a nap about three hours before the game. The coach said, no, you're an idiot. The, the, the doctor said, but you rang me. And so so he did what he was told, the short version is, and they won the Super Bowl or some American football game or something. And so there's anecdotal stories about elite athletes and, and, and getting into breathing and sleep. And, and uh, the extrapolation of that is, so breathing and sleep is back here, mm. but airway is where you start. And jaws and teeth and tongue, that's where that's where you start. And the journey goes back this way mm. and down there. And so the sleep and, and breathing, it, it's all related. And so those guys have really started the conversation a lot in the general public. Yes, I've heard that there's athletes who have a special pod. It's completely dark. They're away from their spouse. Like sleep, you need to protect it before game day or for ultimate repair of the muscles and getting ready for that big game. Uh, another doctor I was speaking to, Dr. Buck, was saying uh, Usain Bolt has won races before with his mouth closed. He's, he's nasal breathing to the finish line. You know what I mean? We have footage of him. He's just got these amazing airways and... You know, it just shows that when everything works well, we can excel and thrive. And we've been looking at athletes, gold medal winners, as though they're genetically, you know, God, gods above human. But I think they've just developed so well. Their airways are healthy. They're sleeping well. And it's giving them these above average superhuman abilities because all of their muscles are oxygenated. They repair well. They detoxify. They sleep properly. You know then, you can lose weight? You know you can lose weight when you go to sleep at night? Yes. Have you heard that practice. joke? Have you heard that joke? Uh, no. So so leptin, guaulin, cortisol, and insulin, they're the four hormones, leptin, guaulin, cortisol, and insulin. And so if, they're, if you're not sleeping long enough or well enough or properly enough or oxygen enough or nitric oxide enough or... I mean, I digress. Uh, uh, Katrina knows there's three main gases when you breathe, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitric oxide. There's three main gases. It's a mix. And if they're out of whack, you're in trouble. But So go back to um, the uh, story I was telling about uh, what story was I telling about? Uh, Athletes. I... You had a joke. Do they all walk into a bar? Oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitri- nitric oxide? I'm not sure. Um, so, oh, I've just lost my train of thought. We'll have to <laughs> keep that from the webinar. I was going to tell you a story about uh, about I've, I've just lost my train of thought totally because I digress. That's my fault. I, I apologize. I apologize. I digress. It'll come back. It'll, um, it'll come back. But um, uh, the uh, I, uh, what I was going to allude to another an area that was in an interest of mine, which is. How do I know? I might come back to my story, or you might delete it. Might, <laughs> might we'll come back. We'll come back to my story about how does Mum and Dad know little Johnny is doing okay? I mean, you know, how do they know that he's got a problem, or how do they know? And I, I, I find that mums and dads they go, you know, I don't think my kid's thriving, and so, well, if they're Lucky, let's say, they might go and trip over maybe my website or they might read one of those books that I, you know, on my website and they'll go, hang on, all these all these symptoms, my kid's got all these symptoms. It's like when mums ring up one of my people and my people can hear the end of the sentence before the mother's finished. And 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 so the mums go, but how do you know that? And they go, well, that we, we hear this every day. I mean, you're not your child's not different to any other child. And so you can look at these kids and go, they look normal, you know, I think they're okay. But unless you've done some, you know, unless you do lots of measure, unless you spend time, time, not two minutes, not six, mm-hmm. unless you spend some time looking, listening, and measuring the children and taking really good histories and really listening. That's when you work out what whether the breathing and sleeping is good, 
and whether the anatomy is good. And I like to spruik that all the time. Yeah. You've got to look at all the symptoms and join the dots, like bedwetting. Yeah. You've got to look at all the symptoms. Because you had it for 14 years. Tell us how bedwetting. I remember the joke now I'll tell you about losing weight. If leptin, guanine, insulin, and uh, I was doing a TV gig. If leptin, guanine, insulin, and cortisol is out of whack, then or no work. If you're sleeping well and sleeping 11 hours a night, really, really good quality sleep, quality sleep, Mm. then um, you can. Well, careful what I say. You won't lose weight, but you can lose weight because all those four those four hormones are in charge of your uh, weight. Generally speaking, generally speaking, they're the four hormones related to weight. And so there's a joke that if you sleep well. You'll, you'll actually lose some weight. And so um, uh, there's medical research to sort of validate that. The other, the other, the other fun thing, the other fun trivia mm. is um, bedwetting. Well, bedwetting a lot of the time, I bedwetted until I was 14 or something because I was a train wreck yeah. anatomically as a kid. God knows how I got to be a dentist or do all this breathing stuff. These days I'm lecturing in America and they think I'm important and I go, no, I'm just a dumb patient. They could have sent I'm... you to the moon had you been breathing well. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So, so <laughs> bedwetting is all about if the mouth, so if you're, if you're, if you're, um, if you're oxygen, I'm getting all excited, I apologise, getting all passionate and excited. If you're oxygen and if you're carbon dioxide and if you're nitric oxide's out of whack, like cooking a cake and you haven't got the ingredients correct. Mm. Like my cooking. If it's out of whack, it's going to be awful. Train wreck. I don't cook. So that's called breathing. If your breathing's not 10 out of 10, yeah. it's going to be, I use the language out of whack. And so if it's really out of whack, the brain turns on the sympathetic nervous system at three o'clock in the morning and goes, Mayday, 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 Mayday. You're talking about those kids that are twitchity and itchity and won't sit still, that's their sympathetic nervous system going, the mouth's open, the oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitric oxide's out of whack, mm. mayday, mayday, and it's got to do with their circulation and it changes their, it changes their blood flow, their blood pressure, um, and that's why you get um, bags under the, the kids get venous pooling, which is, which is blood pooling under the eyes. And so... All that's because the brain's going, mayday, mayday, we're going to get eaten by a lion, and it empties the bladder out at 3 in the morning. Mm. And so the problem's actually above the neck, not mm. below the neck. And and why do I say that? Well, anecdotally, we've seen kids in my office where we've stopped them bedwetting in three days or two days or four days. And so, you know, we'd go whoop, whoop, whoop. But we've seen kids that do better at school in four weeks. And what did we do? All we did was get them to breathe better. We've seen kids where... The family's gone, who is this child? It's a better child. What have they been eating? Oh, they saw that Dr. Mark guy. And so I'm not Santa Claus, but the guys that I hang, well, the guys I hang around with in America are Santa Claus. But you can do some really cool things by getting a child to breathe properly. But if their structure is not proper, Mm. you know, I've had mums say to me, can I lip, can I tape their lips and all these other things? And I've gone, well, let me go back one step. If this bone and this bone aren't grown enough, mm. that child at 99 years old or 89 years old or 18 years old is going to struggle. Mm. And so there's research with uh, McNamara and the research of 1926 with Borg about how much growth and development we really want these bones to be. Mm. And so um, I, I think I think that's all. I think that's all cool stuff. I mean. Uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on a roll. I apologise. I get a bit excited. That was fantastic. It was perfect. And you've got lots of now ideas in my head that I want to share, which some are anecdotal but led me down a path to look at the science. So my firstborn, his teacher's in kindy. We call it prep in Queensland, but it's kindergarten. They were ready to say, go and get him assessed at a paediatrician. He's got these habits that look like on the spectrum. Now, I don't expect you to jump on and say autism has anything to do with breathing, but autism is a real condition. But now we have this thing about children falling somewhere on the spectrum because they're not sociable. Well, they're go kind back of- one step. Go back one step and change yeah. the language. Change the language to behavior. 
just change the language not to autism, not change change the language not to ADHD or the labels. Just go back one step and say some of the kids appear to be um, interesting or behaviour interesting or concentration interesting or, you know, sure. they sure. just don't, or school or, 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 or social interaction, behaviour. I call it behaviour stuff, okay? And there's these behaviours they demonstrate. They're not flourishing socially. The speech is delayed. Maybe they're a little withdrawn. Uh, what else? Has there anybody are... ever? Has anybody said to the? Has anybody checked out whether they're breathing? They ten they out don't of ten. Ask about that because no one knows about it. They go or to the sleeping. And they sleeping ten out of ten. I want to teach sleeping. I want to teach a cool thing. I want to teach a cool thing. So. I don't know if I can do this. I can't do this on a on a, on a Zoom. So when you, when I've got a patient sitting in front of me, Katrina, I, I I I I thump them on the shoulder like that for a minute, mm. and they go, "Hey, Doctor Mark, that's not really pleasant. Uh, can you stop doing that?" Mm. And I go, "Well, imagine sleeping all night, and every five minutes there was not not you stopped breathing." Not not a not a medical apnea or or a hypopnea, not a medical stopping breathing, but just a fragmentation of sleep. Fragmentation. Mm. Do you think if I thumped you all night, you'd sleep well? And they go, no. And I go, well, your eyes might be shut for ten or eleven hours, mm. but your eyes might be shut for ten or eleven hours. But if if you're getting sleep fragmentation, which is just microscopic, because um, sleep is a wave that you get about, I think it's seven of those at night, takes about 90 minutes, kids is a bit longer. If that's being, if that's not ideal, you're going to wake up in the morning feeling like crap. That's a technical word I use. And so the point I make is this. Sometimes we don't know. You know, sometimes it's not bad enough to label. Mm. And so that's why I don't like labelling some of these kids. That's why I, 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 I chose not to talk about, well, autism or ADHD specifically because they're labels. Yeah. But go back to some of the labels we use for, we use the label mouth breathing. Mm. We use the label snoring. We use the label upper airway resistance syndrome, which is especially prevalent with women because women have estrogen, which protects their airway, which is why women and men are different patients at age 40, totally different patients. I see the women at 35 and the guys at 40. We won't go there. So we got, we've got mouth breathing. So we've got mouth breathing, um, snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, sleep fragmentation and sleep apnea and sleep apnea. Now, they're labels and they're real and they're helpful and we use them and they're okay. But you know what I think? Why don't you tell mum and dad that it's not breathing properly? I mean, people understand that. Why don't you just tell them their sleep's lousy? Why don't you just tell them that they're not um, physiologically thriving? So a kid today said, hey, Dr. Mark, what's physiologically mean? And I said, well, you're just an engine. You're just a car, you're just a motor, you're just a car, you're an engine. And it's not working properly. And he goes, well, I get that. He said, is that me? And I said, well, yeah, you're not really running at 10 out of 10. Yeah. And he said, oh, well, I'd like to have my engine to run at 10 out of 10. I'd like to run faster and, you know, whatever, whatever's involved. So, so, so I'm not anti-labels, but I'm mm. making a point that mouth breathing at four or upper airway or, or, or any, any, any diminished or unideal or not 10 out of 10 breathing or sleep ain't good. Yeah. Well, I was hesitant to have one of my children assessed at such a young age to be labelled potentially for life by a paediatrician who's going to look at a cluster of symptoms and say, looks like ADHD, looks like autism, you know, et cetera, because I knew my child was about to start palate expansion and by doing a course of orthodontics, functional orthodontics to develop the palate and develop the airway, we might see a reduction in these symptoms. And lo and behold, as you say, these things can be quite quick. I think about three months in, friends of mine who know my kids say, wow, really come out of their shell, haven't they? Oh, they're like looking me in the eye now and asking me how I am. And, you know, my kids laughing with me more, less sooky, 
asking me about when I was a kid, you know, showing interest in other people and um, you know, yeah, and, and so, what, age, what age can we sort these kids out? We can sort these kids out at, at two and three. We can yeah. sort these kids out at three and a half. We can start treating them at three and a half. And I want to make a point quietly and and make a an important point to mums and dads. Mm. Out in front of my office is about 200 cars. I don't do cars, I do boats. In front of my office is 200 cars and they're all different. They're all, but they, they're all cars. They've got four wheels, a steering wheel, and they drive. You with me still? Yeah, yeah. There's lots of um, dental procedures, dental words, orthodontic words, orthodontic procedures. I know you've mentioned the word functional. You've mentioned the word um, uh, atropic uh, 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 um, uh, words. There's lots of labels word i've mentioned the word that I'm, I'm i'm a breathing sleep guy there's lots of labels okay they're not all the same and the cars in front of my office aren't all the same the mercedes-benz ferrari is different to the second hand 20 year old hyundai so they're all and the truck is different to the diesel trucks different to the uh ferrari okay so there's no right and wrong but there's a lot of different ways to fix things so there's no one right way there's a lot of wrong ways but there's no no right way okay i want to bring up a study and i'll have to tag it in our our video post this podcast it was only so i don't a like to be too confrontational Chris, katrina i don't want to be too so the reason i said that is because i'm just letting mums and dads know that it might they might be seeing the right person they might not be seeing the right person they might be seeing someone who who's whose wavelength is there they might not be i mean it's really really hard you can't mom. walk into an orthodontist and any orthodontist and get the same or dentist and get the same level of care you could get completely different outcomes every pediatrician every ear nose and throat every orthodontist every dentist every physiotherapist every cake maker they're all going to have, every mechanic is going to have their own genre of idiosyncrasy of methodology. Yeah. And so I'm making a loud point that um, it can be hard to know whether you're on the right track or whether another track might be more, the word is efficacious, which means getting a better outcome. Yeah. Can I ask you a question, Dr. Levi? Your thoughts yeah. on the study? Study came out two or three years ago and it was saying there was an autistic facial phenotype. There was a masculinized facial type with autism. And so what they were noticing with these kids was a large forehead, small mid face. And I'm guessing maybe the jaw was jutting out or square. I don't know what masculine means. Perhaps it was a heavy brow. And these kids had symptoms that are looking like autism. Now, what they've described is essentially a face that hasn't grown well and is going to give the child breathing issues or sleep apnea. And they're saying, oh, well, these are autistic kids. Well, maybe they're kids that don't flourish socially, struggle to concentrate, do more habitual behaviours and don't thrive because they don't breathe and oxygenate well. I just don't think that we've got a condition autism that couples with a distinct facial shape. Do you have any thoughts straight off the bat on a study like that? Um, I, I, I revert to my cry or comments, which are, yep. if someone walks into my office and let's talk kids under the age of 15, okay, four, four, three to 15 year olds, four to 15 year olds. If they walked into my office with a label, a, any label, mm. I'm open, I'm open to agree that it might be spot on. But I'm also very, very open that I want to ask about 120 questions relating to the craniofacial respiratory breathing respiratory complex. Yeah. So I don't mind the label and I'll accept the label. And I've heard your question about the sleeps, the report. My, my question is in that report, 
where did it say that they'd asked a lot of, um, you know, we call them abs, airway, breathing, sleep questions. Mm -hmm. You know, where did they ask those questions and when did they measure anatomical breathing structures? Mm -hmm. And so that's all. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not, I, I, I've got a lot of respect for all the medical professionals and all the dental professionals, and I'll go whoop whoop to all the cake makers and all the mechanics and all the physiotherapists. <laughs> But there's a but coming. But when it comes to children today, and we know that 80% of them are underdeveloped, yeah. which means that 80% of them have suboptimal structure to breathe yeah. and sleep mm -hmm. and have brain function, mm. then I think it would be somewhat prudent to put those sort of questions a little bit higher up, up, the, up, up the food chain. And I don't think that's unreasonable to ask. Uh, I don't think it's unreasonable just to add all those sleep and breathing questions up, up, the, up the, uh, it, it into the mix. Yes. And I suppose what we're trying to do by getting this information out to common people so they understand, because you don't get it at your general practitioner when you go to the doctor and say, I've got these symptoms. They're probably not going to talk about diet, breathing, sleep with you. They're probably going to give you a prescription or give you a referral to see a specialist. What we want to see is a, like the undergraduate degrees for dentistry, medicine. Oh yeah, right. But can you, can now you're on the soapbox. Now, now you, now you're on the soapbox. We can do this. It, it's driven by mums. It's driven by mums and dads, Katrina. It's yeah. driven from the bottom up. You know, I see a lot of mums. There's. I, I just want to lay a seat. I'm going to go soon, and I want to lay a seat. Okay, I want to lay a seat because it. It speaks to what you've just spoken about, mm. and it's called frustrated mums, okay, and dads. Mm. So there's going to be a reason why someone would jump on an aeroplane from and fly an hour to see little old me, okay? And the, and the reason they jump on an aeroplane is because of the word frustration. And so they might have had a, their little Johnny doesn't quite look right, their little Johnny doesn't quite look like he's thriving and golly gosh mums no mums no and then mums no and then they go to the gp they're good people he sends them to the ear nose and throat specialist they're good people they get some sort of surgery done they're good people they then come back and go it's not as good as i want they go okay well allergies let's check out allergies and they go on the allergy paths mm. and then um a year or two later they uh, they go, you know, I don't think little Johnny's doing as well as he used to do. He was doing well for a while, but I think he's getting not great again. Yeah. And so these are parents that are looking for the um, why. Yeah. Why is little Johnny at um, 6 or 8 or 11, 12, why is little Johnny not doing as well as he he was doing terribly before? He got better, a little bit better. He's, he's getting crook again. Why? Mm. And so um, we we trip over that scenario a lot mm. and we try and be helpful. And so I I suppose I'm there's not a lot of people out there there could be much more people out there. There were. There could be a lot, lot more people out there pondering airway, breathing, and sleep. That's all mm -hmm. for children. And whether they've got the right airway structure to get efficacious, 10 out of 10, breathing and sleep. Mm -hmm. Because if it's good enough for the elite athletes and the and the and the federers of the world, why isn't it good enough for the kids to get to get really, really good breathing, really good breathing. And so that's just a rhetorical, broad brush comment about how we approach these kids yep. today in 2024, as opposed to 30 years ago or five years ago or 100 years ago. Well, Dr. Levi, thanks for giving your time to a very frustrated mum who's been looking for answers for years now and knows what it's like going around a system spending the money, spending the time, doing the research. It's a part-time job. It's so difficult for parents to find that person who's going to tell them the root cause 
And by getting the word out, I'm hoping we're going to have more professionals looking into airways, sleep medicine, and putting that into their practice so it's not so difficult for mums and dads to help their kids because we're seeing the symptoms and we're like something growing like- very fast it's growing very fast in the u.s yeah in the u.s it's um it's definitely mind you their population's you know bigger than ours mm. obviously mm. so obviously it's growing faster because the numbers are bigger but um i i, I i've tripped over so many um no it's just growing and and uh I believe that uh, mums should be better informed, and and I encourage mums to go and read a. There's a, you know, I, I mean, my gig these days is really kids, and so if they're mums and dads that are listening, um, adults are a complicated bag. But if you're if you understand kids, you'll understand adults, and if you understand kids, you'll understand where adults come from, and if you understand what we're doing to kids, then you'll understand how the adults got there. And so I encourage any mums and any dads to read up. There's a whole raft of good books on my website, which is just a library of airway, breathing, sleep books. They're not my books. Um, and there's some really good information there that the mums go, that actually makes sense to me. And yep. and and I crack a joke that says, who are my favourite patients? The tradesmen. The tradesmen, the guys that understand pipes and, mm-hmm. and, and all breathing is a pipe. It's all yep. it is. Katrina, keep making a noise out there. I'm thrilled with your anthropology, sociology, and your your. So I just want your listeners to know that Katrina, when they said to me, "Can you talk to Katrina?" and I said, "Oh, who's Katrina?" and "Oh, why?" and "Who is she?" and and I went and did some digging, and I went, "Oh my God, who this woman's done all this five thousand year study stuff." So she understands where we've come from, not not two years ago, but thousands and hundreds of years, and and that's why it's a it's a wonderful fresh voice voice in the marketplace that is explaining um, because anthropology we we didn't have a problem we didn't have a problem four hundred years ago we didn't have small jaws four hundred years ago we didn't have ear nose and throat we didn't have wisdom teeth removed we didn't have um, CPAP machines, admittedly, we died early because the lion ate us at age 35 or smallpox or something, but we didn't have a lot of today's problems 400 years ago. So I I, I accolade and uh, salute all your amazing study background, uh, Katrina, and get out there more and hustle more. I will. I plan to. I plan to get the mothers and fathers informed so we go knocking on the right doors for our kids. And where can we go to find you if we're Australian and we want to come and have your services? What's your website? Where are you available online? Where do we find you, Dr Levi? Two answers to that. Number one is uh, just go and find me on, I think, my Instagram. Everything I touch is Dr Levi's, D R L E V I. S. I don't know how we did that because my name's Mark Levi, L E V I. Somehow or other, we put an S on the end, Dr. Levi's. I like anyway. it. Yeah. So I don't know how that happened. But um, the Instagram is, uh, you know, we, we get phone calls on our Instagram from America and Europe because whatever we're, whatever we're doing on Instagram is resonating with mums and dads. Yeah. And so the Instagram is pretty informative. Uh, but my website's pretty cool, you know, for information and for knowledge. Um, and um, I am Sydney based. I'm a Sydney boy. I'm born and bred Sydney boy. And uh, um, I, I'm, uh, but, but, uh, and I hang out in America a lot. I'm over there soon doing some lecturing over there. And I, I, I am seeing my, hero, my heroes in America. But you, the answer to your question is drlevis.com.au is a website. There's a great Instagram and there's just information there. And my people, my team around me tell me what to do, when to do, when to jump and what, how to do it. So I'm just, I'm just a cog in the machine helping Perfect. mums and dads. Perfect. And if mums and dads have issues themselves and they go, hold on, I want to help my kid, but I don't breathe and sleep well, I'm thinking I'm a bit narrow. What kind of treatments non-surgically do you offer adults? Because you're one of the rare few who say, this, there's no limit, age limit to this. We can develop you as an adult. What do you have? Um, right, gee, can you hear that long pregnant pause in my voice? What, have you got a whole list of appliances or is it? The kids are easy. 
the toolbox for children naught to 15 is growing. Mm. And there's some new stuff coming out of America last week for two and three year olds. That's really cool that they've done about a thousand kids in the US so far in the last two years. And it's more an online sort of helping, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's great. To, it's, you know, it's another great tool. And so, uh, that my American buddies have done a great job with that. I, I've been nagging them for about a year and a half. When can I bring it to Australia? And so that's yep. that's hitting the market. And the the other thing is you asked me about adults. Mm -hmm. The toolbox for adults. Um, adults, we can help a lot. Um, they need good diagnosis. We can help a lot. There are lots of tools. To cure adults is really hard work. Really hard work. Are we talking about 40 uh, different things? We can, is, sorry? Are we talking a maxillary skeletal expander or mini screw assisted expander or are you doing a removable device? Are, how do you develop Can I say all of the above? Can I say all of the above? Cool. So can you I have. What else is really. Can I give you a low hanging fruit for an adult? You were looking for an adult. So I'm going to give you a low hanging fruit for an adult. You ready? Yep. So I spoke to, oh, what's her name? Teresa in Melbourne today, yesterday. Mm. So she came and saw me and um, I'm not Santa Claus. I asked her some intelligent questions and thought about it and did some intelligent tests. And, I mean, you know, we do a lot of homework before we touch anybody. I, I encourage all, anybody listening, lots of homework before anybody touches you, mm. not a six-minute appointment. And so we put in her mouth, technically it's called a mandibular advancement splint or in america they call it a mandibular advancement device mad in australia we call a mandibular advancement splint that's what i started uh that's what started my career in night when i turned 40 41 actually and uh uh so that that really was a tool and i had 15 of those next to my bed and uh why did i have 15 i was looking for the perfect one on the world market and so Mandibular advancement splints, you can go Google them. It's just a top a top plate thing and a bottom plate thing and you wear it at night. Yeah. And it and it it makes people breathe better. It just makes adults breathe better. Does it grow and them? So sorry? Will it grow them or will it just hold no. them? Oh. No. So you go to bed, you put this gizmo in the top and bottom, mm. comfortable as heck, if the right people have made it. Put it in the mouth, top and bottom. And it's just it's an area of expertise that needs to be, you know, there are there are there are a couple of very skilled clinicians in each capital city who know how to do this. Mm. But it's very much a handful of skilled clinicians that really do a lot of them. They do like, you know, a hundred a month or something, or a hundred every, you know, a twenty a month or you know, do a lot, okay? Do a lot for a long time. And so it won't grow bone, okay? But it's low hanging fruit, easy peasy Japanese. It's just easy. Whack it in, go to sleep, wake up in the morning and go, Yay! I feel like awesome. <laughs> so that and is I stopped, and I stopped snoring last night and I feel better. And I'm like, and my libido's back. And I'm an adult and I can concentrate at work. Oh my God, what did you shove in my mouth? Which is so, skin, but I get a, many adults saying, is it too late for me? I'm in my 50s. I'm in my 40s. I want to look better. I want anti-aging. You've got to admit there's some anti-aging effects of growing the maxilla especially. Do you have appliances that will stimulate bone? In we can do. We can do. We, we, when I say we, I mean the USA mm. and Australia and parts of Europe have the skills to grow. Mm. Um, yeah, to grow structure mm. as I have grown mine. Yeah, we have the skills, and 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 this is an area that's about. Um, oh, I'm gonna say it's ten years old. I might say it's twenty years old, but it's more like ten, fifteen years old, mm. and it's really hard work and it's complicated, but it's there. And I have a handful of clinicians I know in Australia that have that have done some good stuff. Yeah. Um, I've got a heap of buddies in America that do that every day. They love it. You know, they, they, I mean, America is really, that's where it's all happening. And so, yes, you can do what you're asking me to do, yeah. but I'm laying a seed, a seed that says 
instead of embarking on a two, three, four year project, if on Monday you feel awful and we can help you feel fantastic on Friday mm. with minimal ish cost and comfortable and no big deal, wouldn't that be interesting to a lot of people? that they would wake up in the morning feeling like a human being and better again. And so the lady in Melbourne, we got, well, you know, I'm not saying every, well, I, I like to say we got lucky that she feels better after two days, mm. reinvented her after two days. Mm. And so I'd like to say that we got lucky that it took two days, not yeah. something else. So adults, yeah, there's an opportunity out there. You know, in, uh, in America, I think it's illegal in America now to give to tell someone they need a CPAP breathing machine unless you also offer them Plan B, which is a mandibular advancement device. And so I think the American Sleep Association or the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, I think about two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, three years ago, made it um, a a you know, you have to give people choices and you have to tell people there's two or three ways to do this and uh, there's not just one way to do it. And we all thought, now that's a sensible thing to do. Tell everybody there's choices and let them do their own homework and find out what works best for them. And what so... In December, Vivos brought out their DNA, or not brought it out, they had the DNA appliance, but they had it approved by the FDA as oh, reversing, reversing sleep apnea. Huge, that's massive. Massive, is huge. Is, that Sorry. You, is this something you would use not to necessarily say, I'm going to cure sleep apnea, but I could potentially improve, reverse? They're your- good guys. They're good guys. I like yeah. my. I like those guys. They, they're part of my American family. You know, they're good guys, and uh, they've done some great stuff, and they went public about four years ago. They're, they're, uh, I was at a gig over there uh, in Mexico last year with those guys. They're good guys. And so um, that's not hocus pocus. That's um, They've got rungs, you know, they've got people they've sorted out. So uh, um, they're in there for the long game. That's how, And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat, though, that treatment protocol is hard work. It's a lot of work involved. It's a lot of work involved and a lot of money involved. Yeah. It ain't no two-week gig. Yeah. And so... Um, but I encourage people because we, you, you're nudging me about adults, um, uh, Katrina. I know and so, how much changed my life, and I understand if people thought I can improve my breathing, improve my sleep, which could improve lengthen my lifespan, while having the aesthetic benefit of making me look younger. Let's be honest; the aesthetic benefits are like could be better than surgery. You know the aesthetic benefits of getting 11, 10 hours of efficacious, proper, effective sleep. Experience. Yeah, the skin will look better, but I'm talking about bone. I'm saying like we develop the palate. You know what people look like when they've slept properly. We've all been we've all been out and about, and we're going. You look fantastic. What have you done? And they go, Oh, I had a holiday, and I stopped drinking, and I stopped eating sugar, and I stopped eating crap, and I slept. And you go, Oh my god, you look you're radiating. And so, um, I I I think there's a lot to it, but I'm going to make my I'm going to dig in with my tell your adult um. Tell your adult uh, audience that a mandibular advancement splint made by the right professional in Australia who makes a lot of them and knows what he's doing is a really, really cool, cheap, inexpensive, easy peasy, reboot your, 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 your oxygen breathing, which has profound uh, effects upon everything in your life. And so, but it only works when you put it in and it should be comfortable and it should work. So it should be comfortable and it should work. And and they're the two things. It's got to be comfortable, super comfortable, and it's got to work. And it doesn't cost $20. You know, it, it, it's not a $20 chemist product. It's got to be made by a dental professional that knows his stuff. Yeah. And uh, 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 um, I'm, I'm going to leave the adult discussion of that. Okay. And I'm, I'm, and I'm going to go back. To, I'm going to, I'm going to finish with my. <laughs> I'm going to finish with a cameo about cosmetics. You ready? You ready, Chris, Katrina? Yeah. Yep. 
you, you obviously heard I'm not a label guy. So how about we say this? How about we say that if we can get adults to airway, breathing, sleep better, especially the sleep bit, they will be enhanced in numerous areas, including some cosmetic areas. Mm. Would you agree with that? Yep. Yep. It's a fair call. Yep. But there's more to it than that, right? So you can do lots more with that. But you know, um, and it, and if if we if we get these bony structures to be where they should be, we can do magic. That's so, what I'm hoping you talk about. But you've talked more about the rejuvenating effects of sleep. But you're playing it a bit coy. Um, but that's cool. I'll I tell think- you why. I'll tell you yeah. why. I can talk for hours and hours and hours, <laughs> hours, hours yeah. on the facial. Re- what? What's yeah? I can talk for hours on that. Yeah. What what do you label it as? Tell me the label. I'm facial. saying facial structure. I know people want to hear no, about I, how I, do I improve I, my I can facial talk, I can talk hours on that and I'm very pro it. Okay. Very pro it. Okay. I'm just laying a seed that it's not a four minute webinar subject. And I'm saying it's a complicated long journey to execute um properly. Yes. And so but non-surgical. Um, so I would say lower non-surgical. Yeah, yeah, sure. Non-surgical. No problems at all. One of the one of the leaders in that field was um, uh, Dave Singh. Did a lot of research on that. Dave Singh in uh, the US. But look, there's many in the US. Golly gosh, uh, give me a capital city, and I'll tell you who to ring. I mean, no problems at all. Yeah. And uh, that's all they do all day long. And uh, they do that every day, all day. And. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're 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 good at it. I I um I've chosen to spend more time with the kids because I figure if you fix the kids, then you don't need to be an adult patient in the first place. Yeah. So um, but having said that, I've got all these mums that are thirty five that go. I've got neck ache, back ache, anxiety. I've got a libido issues. I've got my weight's playing up. I've I've got um I grind my teeth. I feel lousy in the morning, and they've got all these symptoms, and they go. I think I, I think I gave my child all these problems, and so they want they want solutions. So there must be another webinar there. There must be another two hour webinar there, Katrina. Weight loss and anti aging. We'll save that for another day. All right. Um, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna say I think you've done a wonderful job getting a message out there to a lot of people about information. It's good information. You're doing a wonderful, marvelous job out there, helping mums and dads and adults and people understand this area this big huge massive area and i'd like to see you speak in america at one of our big 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 gigs because i think your um non-medical non-surgical non-dental non-physiotherapy non-cake cooking background (laughs) is so cool that you speak you speak um you and your training is so cool that you your your messaging is so ninety nine percent close to ninety nine percent on target that it, it 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 you could speak to mums and dads and you could also speak to Harley Street Macquarie Street um, I don't know where it Collins Street I don't know where it is in New okay. York specialist awesome. I'll be there I'll see you over right. there Dr Levi it Can was I... yeah. It was Keep such going. a happy time, Dr. Levi. This is such an uh, enjoyable conversation to have with you. It's really, really my pleasure. I'm really thrilled to spend some time with you, Katrina. I hope we can do it again soon. And I uh, I hope we can, um, I hope you can uh, spread the word and change some lives. And, uh, you know, for every child or every adult, you get breathing better. You're changing a life and uh, you're changing the quality of people's lives out there. And I salute that. I, I, I take my hat off to you. I, 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 otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you yeah, <laughs> because I think you're doing a marvelous, marvelous um, job. Um, Can I officially uh, sign off? Can I um, run away and go <laughs> away? Yeah. Good night. I've been sending so many people your way. Um, hopefully, they they mentioned me and say Katrina sent me. Such a pleasure. Good night, Dr. Levi, and I'll chat to you soon. Talk soon, Katrina. Bye. Bye.